Sublime art, really, because it's one of those things that you can't actually explain how you do it. You can't. I, I, I even when I um, when I was doing it, I couldn't. It's all. It was pure feeling. It was just feeling. Um, it was amazing. Uh, it, was a weir- it was a weird little tiny, you know, because T9 only lived for about ten years tops. If that. If that. There was, it was a weird transitional. You know, it's probably going to be it's going to be romanticized in some indie film a hundred years from now. They're going to be like that's going to be nice. That's going to be crazy. No, what you're going to get it's like a cyberpunk Ghost in the Shell movie, where they do they do this cyberpunk thing where they do cassette futurism. Oh, gotcha. All right, T nine futurism. <laughs> and it's the future, and they purposely do T nine on flip phones. Flip phone futurism. Because, they, because that's how far the fashion has gone. Dude, I kind of want f- flip phone futurism. That sounds fucking awesome. Where it's like you have like every there is like internet technologies like penetrated all aspects of life, but it's like analog. Everything has buttons. And well, like, it's like everything's integrated in your mind. Yeah. So if it's analog, it's only because you want it to be. So we've dispensed with the whole like s- touch screen as the uh-huh. conduit of, from our, of our thoughts to the virtual world and actually become more sophisticated by returning to a concrete. That'd be, I mean, there, I, there is precedent for well, that. Well, it's an know? optional voluntary statement yeah. to do that because nothing has to be physical at that future point at all because it's all integrated into your biomechanics. Yeah, when you make enough progress in some domain, you um, create the possibility that you can voluntarily um, readopt some more elegant, graceful elements of the past that you dispensed with in your relentless drive toward efficiency. Well, there's a, and there's a comparison to car culture there. Like, the, your choice of car is more meaningful when it's, like, less practical or farther back in time. Yeah. Like, things of the 80s that were just, like, this is the cars you had to choose from. Yeah. And so it's not meaningful at all. But then, like, to go back and find a car that was specifically only made in the 80s because you want to have it. And is emblematic of the 80s. Is now a more meaningful choice. Yes, that's true. Or, like, the culture of the totally shitty cars that the Soviet Union made. Now there's a cult culture about repurposing those old, terrible Soviet cars oh, yeah. what are into, they, like, workable machines. Those little square toaster mobiles? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what are those things? Aren't they called, like, they're not called Dasha. Dasha, are they? Or is it, like, something like that? It's like that, I don't know. It's like, so I think it starts with a D. I yeah, can, very Russian-sounding. I can cut it in okay, right. to the footage after. And that'll get me in practice right now to be in my editor's mindset while I am podcasting. That's the juggling act. That's where my edge is right now of right. this show, is getting better at editing mm-hmm. while I'm podcasting. Yeah. The meta mind, the future, imagined future looking back mind. Yep. Imagining yourself editing this on a video screen hours from now. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. You're there right now. Yeah. I'm there right now. <laughs> You're just not conscious of that three-dimensional slice of the four-dimensional matrix that is our universe. Yeah, that at least four dimensions. That <clears throat> physical moment is leaping through my perceptive neurons too fast mm-hmm. to perceive right now. Yeah. And it'll slow down for my neurons to catch. Um, at some point, and that's when I'll be focused in that moment. Uh, so the California recall election. Yes, um, I was thinking. Um, I was thinking about 
I was thinking about voting for the black dude um, just right. be, just because he's the most popular and also uh, I just feel like a Republican black dude is a formidable force because they're more dif- relatively more difficult to cancel. That's right. And um, I, you know, he has like he's not Gavin Newsom, so he has that going for him. I don't really know much about Larry Elder um, other than that he was a talk show host. Um, I think that. Uh, what he probably doesn't have going for him is, well, he's an old, he's just old, um, and like I think probably, you know, he's strikes me as someone who's probably pretty ideological um, and kind of definitely more culture entertainment oriented of a person. Um, he's had a radio show. I think that probably that doesn't make for a super effective leaders um, because you, I, I totally see him just getting like mired in the culture war for the next however long. So I, I, I think, I but don't know. That, I, there's a case mm-hmm. to be made that that's the only effective way to be a figurehead politician now. Well, that's... Could, could Trump have actually enacted any change at all in... Well, this is, I hate this argument already before I'm even finished. It's okay. Yeah, it has <laughs> but merits. You could argue that Donald Trump was only able to affect change in the world by resorting to his public persona and using, yeah. using uh, culture as yes. the tool. I'm, so, I'm just really sick of that style of politics, and I feel like I want to... Yeah, you want someone who's, like Andrew Yang, who's yeah. actually working on... Solutions. Yeah, and I and I, I don't want to um, feed the media culture war frenzy machine with another, um, you know, like ideologically outspoken, uh, th- you know, kind of figurehead. Um, even you're, even you're if that's what gets attention, he's more ideological I th- because he's a radio yeah, show host. Yeah, yeah, I, I think exactly. That's, that's just a. You need to be a little more ideological to be a better talk show host. Yeah, you need to be um, like, um, you know, like witty and you know. I'm sure the guy's obviously an intelligent, competent person because he wouldn't he wouldn't be famous. He wouldn't have gotten where, you know, he he is. Um, the guy, I'm sure he'd be better than Kevin Newsom. That's the thing. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I think that I could just almost see like the writing on the wall of what the next, what would happen if he did actually win, if Gavin Newsom was recalled and this guy replaced him. Um, there was a, like, I was like browsing the news this morning and the there was like four hit pieces from like four different newspapers, like LA Times, um, and like a, a bunch of other ones um, that were something like, like, oh, like Larry Elder once said that like, women uh, complain about feminism or something like that. Something that like clearly like they went through and like found like a quote that he said one time and like now are trying to paint him as uh, you know like a a chauvinist or whatever. And I was like oh wow that's really telling of your playbook. So here we have uh, a black dude so you can't play the racism card. What's your plan B? Oh the sexism card. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, what we really need is a black woman. Okay, what card would you play then? Would it be the, you know... Uh, you would make her vote. a turf. There we go. Okay. <laughs> you, so would, she's, you would make sure she... Right, would, she'd be anti-trans, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, well, so what if it was a trans black woman? <laughs> what, what would she... What would th- 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 they what be... A nightmare. What kind of monster are they? <laughs> see. So, uh, I'm just saying, that kind of thing is a depressing preview of one possible thing, I think, um, so, electing a... So you want someone who cuts underneath all that cultural stuff I want someone and doesn't stir up any of yeah, that. Yeah, I want someone who is difficult to pin down about what exactly it is that, that you can try to stick on them for the purposes of like maligning their character. But there's a trade-off there of mm-hmm. being focused and intentional and mm-hmm. direct Yeah, makes you maximally easy to paint targets on. That's true. But that uh, makes you maximally effective as a um, government engineer. Yeah. I like, um, I like the idea of a government engineer who is open and transparent about the iterative process and design philosophy of what they're doing. Like, you know, the way and Elon... So the you're, way, you're implying a younger personality by that statement. Yeah. Um, you may have seen the Kevin dude, whatever, whatever his name is, he has a weird last name. That it is running? Mm-hmm. And you're more in favor of Kevin Dude? 
Mm, I was. I only found out about this guy like three days ago, but he's 29 years old. He's a YouTuber. He's running as a Democrat nominally, but he supports a bunch of things like he supports gun ownership. He supports uh, doing something about homelessness problem. Um, he supports. But that's uh, a meaningless. Statement. Well, it's he's been. People have like said like, oh, he supports, he supports using the National Guard to round up homeless people. Uh, it's not really what he said. He says, you know, he, he wants to make materially, like, clear out. Um, okay. Encampments and like get mental health people to help them and like you know do something about the problem rather than just um, ideologically. I, I'm I'm not really in this guy's camp. I'm not sure if I'm going to vote for him or not. Um, I'm going to do a little more research on it. But I just think having a 29 year old person who's you know you kind of get an Andrew Yang ish vibe from him a little bit. You know he's definitely he's into like his YouTube channel was about like investing in stocks. So he de have, definitely has that little bit of like a stock bro, stock douche bro guy going on. Yeah, but running as a Democrat um, um, is a real warning sign for me. Uh, it's a ploy. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's done for strategic reasons because there's going to be a lot of people who are going to vote no on recall and then they're going to, you know, fill in the bubble next to the Democrat who's running. And so, but saying you're a Democrat like undercuts everything you want to do after that. If you think you then have to play to your Democratic base. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is I don't think he has to. He's he's counting on the fact that he's just going to get in by people filling in the bubble next to Democrat who, you know, because what Gavin Newsom's recall campaign is saying, which you know, and and the California Democratic Party. It's absolutely mind blowing that they're messaging about this. What they're literally saying, the messaging they're putting out, the um, their official recommendation of how to vote is no, no on the recall, and leave the second question blank. Um, it's crazy. The that, second question being, who would you choose? Exactly, because the whole thing is his his idea is that this election is somehow illegitimate. Um, and that that you should vote no, and then not even not even choose a backup. So it's really kind of a psychotic suicide strategy that basically he's saying like if you can't if you recall me, then you don't even you don't get to deserve you don't deserve to, to say who is in my replacement. Well, you know? No, he's he's speaking to. That strategy is speaking to a hypothetical group of people who think Gavin Newsom is good for the state. Mm -hmm. And so if we were in a fantasy world where Gavin Newsom was the right guy, yeah. then that's the physical thing you have to do to keep him in power. Like, you want Gavin Newsom to stay? Okay, then you tech, in technical terms, you need to vote no on recall and then leave the next question blank. Uh, no, because the, leaving the question, if you vote no, um, the only way that that second question becomes relevant at all is if the yes vote gets more than 50%. So you could, by not by leaving the second question blank, all you're doing is giving up your vote in the case, conditionally, that he gets removed. Oh, okay, so that kind of doesn't make any sense. Like, he, you... You're just like giving up your vote for exactly. no reason. Exactly. Just because someone tells you to. Yeah, exactly. He's basically saying, don't even admit. It's like a kind of magical thinking saying, it's not possible that I'm going to be removed. It's like a bluff. It's like he's trying to project confidence that it's not even worth considering the fact that I'm going to get removed. So don't even, don't even count, don't even prepare for that possibility. And that kind of makes me think, like, wow, this dude's worried. Um, I mean, he's done, man. He's six feet deep. There's no fucking way he's staying in office. Um, I've listened to a full Ben Shapiro 50-minute mm -hmm. special uh, with Larry Elder. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry basically talked the entire time with very little uh, input from Ben. Um, and... That was before he was running. That was before COVID. Okay. I was in like 2019. Um, so a much different world. Right. And uh, I was really impressed with him. It was a really inspirational life story he has. And the way he, he spent like 20 minutes of it um, 
telling stories about his dad yeah. and his relationship with his dad and growing yeah. up hating his dad and then not talking to his dad for like 15 years straight and then a catharsis that they were able to achieve together and now a healthy relationship that they have with each other now. Like he circled back around as an adult to start developing a relationship with his dad. That was a really beautiful story. So that was like a base positive feeling I had about Larry Elder. Um, more overtly Republican, but um, everything he had to say was thought out in his own words. It wasn't a rational mind blank out yeah. at any point of yeah. explaining his Republican positions. Right. Uh, so that's like his weakest point, just being like openly in this direction yeah. policy wise. Yeah. Um, like, he, he does have actual grounded mm -hmm. thought and evidence and proof and references yeah. for everything he thinks. But then, uh, now that he's running, that opens you up to uh, have blank outs um, because you're forced to take positions yeah. on things that are current that you might not have any expertise in but you're gonna be asked in, in interviews, questions about it constantly. And so that's where politician rig like bullshit talk comes in. Spe speaking with someone else's words. To say nothing. Yeah. Um, and you could just say, I'm not good at that. Here's who I'm looking at to work on that with me because I'm not good at that. Yeah. That'd be the honest thing to say. Yeah. And politicians don't really do that when they're running for office. Uh, they don't say, I don't know, um, he, who, here's who I'm looking at who does know and is going to help me there. Yeah. And so I, I, since he started running, I've only listened to a five-minute Fox News segment on him, oh, with him. Or he right. Talked, so he talked for five minutes. Yeah. And he mainly talked about education and his case for uh, incentivizing more private schools yeah. and uh, opening up private schools, opening up the ability of, of citizens to choose which schools they take their kids to. Because right now, black kids and ghetto kids are forced to go to public schools. They aren't even allowed to apply for charter schools. And so it keeps things racially segregated and it keeps people in the worst neighborhoods, yeah. like in the worst schools. Yeah. So he had insight about that and mm. what he wanted to do about that to fix that. That was good. And then he was asked about homelessness and he just had no answer. Yeah. He just said a bunch of nonsense bullshit right. that said, I have no fucking idea what to do about homelessness. Yeah. And so that's in California, yeah. If you're running for the top position in California, yeah. you need to fucking have a plan for what the fuck we're going to do about homelessness. I know, you need to have like an actual developed plan about it too, not like... Um, a practical plan yeah. of action, because we're right. sinking. We're yeah, sinking I, under the weight of the entire nation's homeless population. Yeah, and I think that it's um, one of those things that is acting as kind of like a spoiler to every other issue because it's keeping people feeling very demoralized that collectively um, what should by all accounts be a pretty fucking obvious bipartisan issue of like it's a health concern yeah of like it's an of economic like, concern of like solving this mass human suffering on the street it's like basically like if um, there was two roommates and they were they would quarrel all the time but then like one day they come home and found that like an animal took a giant shit on their living room floor uh, you would think that that would uh, you know <laughs> lead to some uh, collective action to remove that problem except instead of a giant pile of shit it's human beings and they're suffering so you have the double whammy of not only like ruining urban space generally but also like um, a kind of, you know, th you know, thousands of people just like living in squalor and suffering and like, not like, you know, like people who are like schizophrenic, um, and uh, 
you know, like there's like some criminals, you know, taking advantage of it, but they're probably just like, you know, juicing the other actually homeless people for money. And it's this horrible, you know, little slumlord situation you got going on. The longer it sits there, the more of its own little regressive micro political system those camps develop and it just becomes like it's a terrible it's a terrible testament to the inability of people to solve practical problems and i think just that homeless problem being unsolved is almost like a living concrete symbol of the fact that um we're fucked because like does anyone really believe unconsciously that we can fix the global environmental issues um you know, climate change or whatever, if you can't even solve, like, a local city-scale collective issue? Like, no. So I, I think, you know, if there was a politician that actually got up and was like, here's my plan, um, you know, we're going to, like, deploy, like, we're going to spend, like, billions of dollars and create, like, a whole new core of people who were professionals and whose entire job was to solve this issue by, um, you know, clearing out slums and then, like, diverting people to... Um, the treatment that they need and like if you're there just to like rob people well then you know we'll call the police or whatever but if there was like a success that you know solved that problem decisively and you could see like a night and day difference that'd be like really inspirational because it would probably you know it would make people think like oh it's actually possible to do something about it so I feel like almost you have to solve those collective problems on a local scale before you can even start talking about doing anything uh, on a like a you know global global scale or something like that so i think uh th th the big problem there is political correctness um, is it yes you can't be i i like i think it's even a problem to point out uh suffering as one of the aspects of what's happening there wait wait what is anyone denying that like people are suffering I think the problem is thinking that's your problem, that someone else is suffering. It's not Chico's problem that people are suffering, and it destroys Chico directly to make it our problem, to take responsibility for the suffering of other people who are just going to choose that the more you enable it. And political correctness is saying we have to be polite and respect other people's right to take a shit in our house instead of kicking them the fuck out, saying this yeah. isn't our problem. We have problems, and we can't deal with other people's problems on top of your problems. But yeah. being unwilling to be rude means people are just going to take a shit in our city plaza and make it a terrible place to collect to meet with each other in the center of our own city yeah. and so we just what we give up the center of our city we just give up Bidwell Park because we're too polite to kick out heroin addicts who are just making piles of trash in the middle of it, the fucking you know, public it, space it, it, that we are paying for it is a weird thing it is a weird little statement of maybe how um the real lack of value that a lot of people place in their own community that they think they feel like maybe they deserve to have everything spoiled or something like that. It's like a kind of, um, you don't have a very generous opinion of yourself if you think you are supposed, you know, like supposed to tolerate that kind of like trash piles and stuff everywhere. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, um, I agree with, so I agree with you there, I guess, um, when it comes to people who are like severely mentally ill though, which I do think is a significant percentage of people who are homeless, um, who were either like legitimately mentally ill and then became homeless because of it or became homeless for some other reason and then being homeless made them mentally ill in a way or like just like fucked up somehow. Um, I, I think that like, y you, you know, it's not like it's an impossible problem to solve. Um, you know, if there was someone who, like, walked into my house and was, like, bleeding from an artery, fuck yeah, I'm going to help them. You know what I mean? It's like, that's, that's there a are... physical problem. Well, I mean... Like, you... Yeah. It, it, it's a physical problem. This problem 
requires the voluntary yeah. progression of the individuals involved, which you can't do anything to make someone else's choice for them. And are you going to well, give up your life force I, while they decide whether no, they're going to get I, their lives I together it, or not? I think it also involves a somewhat of an involuntary like song like the very phrase contains the error you're making here of solving the problem no one can solve those fucking problems for these people except themselves no i disagree with that i think that some people could solve those problems and i don't normally advocate okay then then mm -hmm. it becomes a workload issue yeah we can help those people solve their problems a small, small amount of them, uh, and we have about 500% more of those people than we can effectively help. So we need to fucking kick out everyone except the people we can actually help. Um, yeah, I think that... It's a uh, decision between actually helping people in that very rude right. context that requires kicking people out first, right. or letting our whole town go up in fucking flames. I think it's a false dichotomy to choose between helping people and kicking them out. Um, I think that kicking them out and, and like clearing out like um, like squalid camps of human suffering would be doing everyone a favor who lives there um, at the end, like on balance, because, you know, um, like those things are just like little nexuses of... Yeah, they just of, make things worse. They make things worse. And like if you have like a bunch of addicts living in a place, uh, that's going to create more addicts because now those people are like, they're just like spreading that disease. So it's like a kind of blight or whatever. And um, yeah, I mean, I really look at it as a collective health issue of like the mental and like kind of the spiritual health of society. Um, the spiritual disease of society is like creating these festering pockets of human suffering. So, you know, if you are trying to heal your body and you have a wound, it's gonna hurt, but you have to like clean it and like bandage it. Um, I think that the government um, you know, the government spends like, you know, massive resources doing all sort of, doing a lot of like public social enterprises, like building roads and stuff like that. And you know, there's like the whole debate about whether that should be privatized, but whatever, just leaving that aside for a second, accepting the current reality of the way things work. Um, you know, spending a collective effort on like, um, you know, removing uh, the pockets of human suffering and then offering help to those who are willing to take it. H how could you be against that? Because if you're, if you're against that, then basically you're either saying, no, we shouldn't help diseased people. Like, and like, I don't know, to me it just seems like a basic tenet of human decency that like if someone's diseased, it's the right thing to do to like offer them help. You know what I mean? Like, if you see, like, a child who's lost, you'd be like, hey, can I help you? You know what I mean? Like, someone who's in a fucking the depths of mental illness is kind of like a child where they, like, they'd really benefit if someone fucking helped them. But it's, like, uh, foolish to think that it applies to everyone. I agree with you there. I don't know what the percentage is. I really don't know what it is. Um, it's hard to say without some experimental evidence, but we, it seems like we've never actually, you know, we're painting everyone in the same brush. It's like it's this... It is, it's like this ideological debate that is like stripped of nuance. So I think what it can't be government money and government agencies because government doesn't know how to do anything except grow. <sighs> yeah, and see, that's the problem. Become more parasitic. That, that's what it comes down to. You, you incentivize yes. private organizations yeah. to compete to create objective mm -hmm. truth of healing. Yeah, and they get the most help, and so you create a market of private organizations that are need to show their ability to yes. help individual people. I think that, you know, this reminds me of a really interesting idea that I've been thinking about. Um, I was turned on to this by this one blog that writes about crypto stuff. Oh, and I didn't finish uh, oh. my statement about oh. Larry Elder either. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, come back to that in a second. Got this, it. Um, this idea of what you just said, like, it just made me think of this idea called um, retroactive funding for public goods, which is this um, idea that's being played with in the crypto world of experimental economic and monetary policy, where... Wait, say the label again. Uh, retroactive funding for public goods. And the way, the idea of it is that if you um, create some sort of uh, public good 
or you solve a collective problem, you do something to improve the state of the commons, then you people can vote to um, reward you with public money after you did the thing that you said you were going to do. So no, it's, that's instead, very good. Instead of like. We need to raise $10 billion to solve homelessness. It's there's people that go, that raise some capital from people who believe in them and go, okay, you know me, you know me, you know me. If you believe that I'm capable of doing what I say I'm going to do, then you can invest your money and then I do it and then I prove it to the public and then the public votes to allocate money to pay me back and my investors back. And I'm like, that's a fucking solid idea because what it's doing is it's taking advantage of the fact that people, when they're investing their own money, are making an honest decision about the capability of a person to do something with the money slash power that they're giving them. Yeah, the the yeah. startup capital is purely voluntary. Yes. And then after that, any public funding yes. is retroactive. It's based on yes. results only. So what you're doing is you're basically saying we don't have to loan bureaucrats money and hope they do something with it. What we can do is we can still have like public funding, but the fund that pool of public funds is used to pay back successful um, independent efforts to do things. Mm -hmm. I think it's like an amazing idea because if yes. you did that and you said, okay, look, there is like the, the California X Prize competition. We have a hundred billion dollars. If you can demonstrably solve the homeless issue, then you get access to this money yeah. by democratic vote. Then you have a lot of people, you have, people would start companies immediately to try to solve that problem. And they'd be like, okay, we're going to do a thing where we build a, we buy some land and we build an area where people can come and they can move their tent here and then they can learn to cook, they can learn skills, and then they can do, you know, there'd be like a million different strategies that you could try because that's what you need. To solve a complex problem, you have to have a lot of iterative strategy type, you know, it's just like any other problem. You can't just be like, Based on ideological ideas, we've randomly assigned this guy to shit something out of his brain and hope that it works. And if it doesn't, right. we're going to blame these people. Like, that's the, bureau that's the government way of solving problems currently. So it's, that's why it fails to solve all complex problems. It's just tricky in my mind to even think of it as solving the problem. Like, that's like a mechanics thing. Mm -hmm. Like... What's wrong in the machine? Where's it going wrong? Fix that part. Right. The problem solved. Yeah. Like, uh, that, you run into problems immediately just saying we could solve the homeless problem. Like, no, that's the, the existential issue that a person's life is in their own hands and that no one can help them except themselves at the end of the day like means that you can't solve someone else's problem. That's true. Yes. There's always going to be some homeless people. So so right. even saying who's going to solve the homeless problem, that's like a war on terror, a war on drugs sort of thing. Like you're picking a game that cannot be won. I think but but what well, so my counter argument to that though is that I think there is obviously so I agree with you it's And I'm not, not I'm not saying by that that nothing can be done. Mm. I'm, I'm saying quite the opposite, that like immediate iterative yeah. action with learning at yeah. every step to iterate something better yeah. needs to be started now yes. with the understanding that we're going to be working on it still 10 right. years from now right. and 20 years from now. And this is a reflection of our soul as a country. Yeah. It's an ongoing existential development. Right. It's not a problem to solve. Like it's not like, oh, this new ailment, like find the right medicine so we can stop thinking about it. This is an existential eternal issue. Yeah, it's never the the, the possibility is never going to be absent. It's it's a reflection of a current state of affairs. You can look at the year twenty twenty one, you know, you can look at the year nineteen seventy five. In California, was the homeless problem was it in nineteen seventy five compared to twenty twenty one um, 2021 has way worse of a homeless problem. So what changed? Um, you can measure it however you want to. The number of people on the street, the amount of money it costs every year, however you want to measure this problem, um, it's demonstrably worse now than it was. So what changed? I think that the what changed extrinsic factors is the domain of where 
you could problem solve this issue. Yeah, um, beyond I agree that, with that. Yeah, beyond that, of course, there's going to be always, always be homeless people, and it's going to be related to, I remember something you said before about how there's certain people that just don't fit in society, that just do not play the game, and they want to be homeless. And actually, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want to live in a society where people have the freedom to live on the street if they so desire. I don't, but I think that that's a pretty small, manageable number of people who are just voluntarily like that. And it wouldn't crush society, and those people have existed since the beginning of time, and... Well, they've never uh, come up and laid a bill of debt due yeah. to people who have nothing to do with them exactly. before. No. Yeah. They just want to be left alone. It's a benign problem. It's not a malignant issue. Right. Right. And democratic policies make it a malignant problem because it yeah. makes it your problem if someone else that you don't even know is suffering. Yes. Which is just wrong. Well, and that's, I think, that's what, I mean, this, this It's the same thing as Republican mm -hmm. interventionist war yeah. uh, back in the Iraq times. Oh, shit. We're like, have to talk about if, that. if some other conflict is happening somewhere else in the world, it's our problem. We have to go in and solve it. Yeah, it's I think. the same thing. I think with the whole Afghanistan In thing, terms of being completely ineffectual. Right. Um, well, you could, well, you should finish your thought about, uh. Larry Elder, what you were saying about him. Yeah, I'll tie a bow on the Larry Elder conversation that yeah. I do think the simple fact of him being intelligent and rational mm -hmm. and a black Republican at the head of California, I do think that's symbol uh, sufficient symbolic power to make him uh, probably the best <clears throat> candidate mm. because it just undercuts all the ideological firepower that yeah. Democrats have. And it neutralizes all the most uh, obstructionist things that are getting in the way of the communication. It all just neutralizes the, uh, those charges. Yeah. All the racial stereotypes that have become the standard playbook and it, of it, Democrats. And yeah. it forces That's the true. Democrats to show their hand right. that they're fucking uh, in... Uh, they're dishonest actors. That they've become like pro-segregation. <laughs> yes. And like sort of like racial essentialists. Yes. And it's, yeah, it's fucking, I'm, I don't know, the more I think about it, I actually start to think it's really offensive, man. Like, damn. I don't know, at some point people are going to realize like and kind of sort of quietly back away from this little package of ideological content. Well, that in is, that sense, you know it's closer mean? to the truth yeah. to have this Republican governor at the top of a blue state. Right. Like... That's a more accurate uh, right. dream symbol yeah. of our cultural mind right. and the actual situation on the ground that yeah. you and me experience from day to day yeah. is that people don't fit into these fucking boxes. Yeah, I'm really in Everything's favor. actually a spectrum. Everything yes. actually like mixes and yes. the crucial ingredient is the individual, not the yeah. camp, not the team. Yeah, the idea that somebody could be successful outside of those political stereotypes is very threatening to the people whose power depends upon uh, maintaining and promulgating those political stereotypes. So in that sense, I'm in favor of like things that s subvert and undermine um, political stereotypes. Um, I don't know. I, mean, I think it's just because the Democrats are in power right now. It seems like... Um, yeah, they're just kind of having a heyday with a lot of really racist stereotypes um, whilst kind of, and they're, yeah, they're building like a whole program of social authoritarianism around dividing people well, all, and, on various and like, everything, um, every, cultural issues. You every know? policy direction yeah. that Democrats are going for right now is in direct opposition to the reality we find ourselves in. Yeah, it's a very like, dark slope, the, honestly. What, what's the biggest immediate present pressing problems of California? Yeah. Homelessness. Yes. Who are the people most directly getting in the way of doing anything about it? Yeah. It's the Democrats. Well, if, what's the next biggest fucking right. problem? Wildfires. Yeah. Who are the people getting in the most direct way of actually addressing all the underbrush that makes fires happen. It's the Democrats refusing to cut down the size of forests and get in there and clear things out so fires don't happen. It's Democrats saying that we need to focus on solar panels and shit. 
So like, well, I think we should. I, I, I'm all for focusing on solar panels and shit. I'm not. Really? Uh, solar panel, there's way better ways to get renewable power than solar panels. Solar panels haven't been iterated on. They've been forever. iterated on a lot. But they're they, still not efficient. They're highly efficient compared to where they were even five years ago. No, solar panel technology is the future, man. That's I'm my opinion. I'm not sure about that. I think it takes up a maximum amount of space. You have to clear that space to put solar panels there. No, you don't. You can put it on roofs, rooftops, parking lots. You could, have, you could have rooftops and parking lots of urban areas providing shade and cooling. And the thing is, is the, the problem is that America um, completely like decimated its solar panel, solar panel manufacturing capacity and sold it out. And now China is the leading manufacturer of solar panels in the world, including the solar panel that's in my van, made in China. <laughs> and I bought it for $100, and it's an amazing solar panel that can charge my battery everywhere I go. Um, and it's like, uh, no pun intended, light years beyond um, you know, even like 10 years ago, solar panel tech. I, the reason I'm a big fan of solar panels is because they represent a decentralized energy paradigm to where you can generate electricity from uh, a large number of sources rather than having centralized sources. Because I think centralized electricity generation just creates fragility. Um, so I don't know. I, oh, well, I can, I can be convinced on that. Hmm. Um, in terms of wildfires, I think the policy is to focus on unsolvable global warming 30-year yeah, plans. No, I agree with you there. Uh, when we have immediate yes. pressing uh, concerns of clearing out the forest. Exactly. So next summer yeah. won't be a completely yes. destructive I agree time. that making, making the wildfire debate, just pushing that into the box of the climate change thing is hopelessly defeatist and terrible and is gonna just make things worse. Because there are plenty of mitigative, like mit things you could do to mitigate wildfires that like, okay, look, we all hope that we fucking solve climate change in some way, but you can't count on that to, mm -hmm. to deal with wildfires in some way. Like, I have no doubt that like droughts and shit make things worse, but it's, it's, I'm sure it's not one thing or the other. There's also the fact that, you know, we've, like when you suppress fires, like even like this is not controversial. Like people recognize this now. Like when you suppress fires for many many years, you know you create a kind of debt, an ecological debt in the system where well you just have logs on the fire yeah, waiting to be sparked. Yeah, quite up. literally, right? So um, yeah, it's it, it's an example of the inability of a centralized bureaucracies to deal with any sort of problem that is fundamentally ecological or. Um, highly complex. So, you know, we fail to deal with um, forest ecology. We fail to deal with um, human health. We fail to deal with uh, human life, you know? So this is like homelessness. All of these are examples of um, problems that have to be solved in iterative, parallel, decentralized ways because the nature of the subject itself is um, massively diverse and decentralized. So you can't, you can't have like, you know, proclamations issued down, echoing down from the throne room that are somehow going to be implement, implemented at the base level of where things are occurring. This is not how it works. Like some classes, all the classes of problems that require decentralized solutions um, are these like joke level failures when and, and th that provides the seed for ideological conflict because when people see a failure of like their trusted government to do something, it, it raises the idea that there's someone sabotaging this and so it's either the Republicans' fault or the Democrats' fault depending on your ideological inclinations. Um, the reality of it is that um, people want to blame collective failure on specific actors because it makes the problem seem tractical, tractable. COVID is an example. COVID is a perfect example of this. You know, we kind of failed to stop this virus. The lockdowns didn't work, masks didn't work. Vaccines, uh, you know, well, with all the variants, seems like they don't really work that well either. Um, so who are we gonna blame? Oh, anti-vaxxers, oh, you know, like any, so it's just like you can see this process of, you know, like over-promising, failing to deliver, then scapegoating. You can see that process playing out in, real time, like a slow motion movie or something. Um, you know, I don't know. So I guess I'm just gonna keep pre preaching the gospel of decentralization. I'm kind of a one trick pony in that regard.
<sighs> everything is related to this um, decentralization versus centralization thing, well, I think, in the political sphere. Things, things are solved by individuals, and so you have to maximally incentivize and free individuals Absolutely. to solve the problems that they can yes. see as personally solvable. Because that's how you harness human intelligence. That's right. By, by locating the locus of action with the locus of thought. You can't displace the locus of action far away from the actual brains that think and expect there to be a good result because you're destroying a tremendous amount of perception and memory in the process of and, doing and that. And you have the ability with libertarianism in general to harness the survival instinct. Uh, if it's government money thrown at a problem, none of the individuals receiving that money to solve the problem have any market incentive to do any better than the person next to them because they already got the paycheck. So why the fuck should they try that hard if they, yeah. if the, if they actually solved the problem, they'd stop getting the paycheck? Yeah. You know, I think that being um, pro-market versus anti-market is kind of a moot argument because in reality, it's an illusion that we have an alternative to a market. The truth is you either have a market in terms of money, or you have a market for political influence. You're living in a market one way or the other, yeah. except one of those is really not very, it's not designed to be very equal and fair. And it's designed and to- it, 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 yeah. it falls back on the power of a gun at it the does. end of the day. Yeah, and, it, and what you're trying to do, so in, in, a, like a, in a money market, you know, like in a capitalism or whatever, what you're trying to do is you're trying to create systems that accumulate capital and you're trying to get money. And people are like, oh, trying to get money? So greedy. It's like, so we should appoint um, people to do the right thing, and they don't need to worry about getting money. They can just be in charge, and they can make the right thing happen. Okay, so in that system, you have people in charge. So now everyone else is competing to get tokens of social influence and favor and build up um, you know, the good graces and social credit of people who have the power to tell the people with guns to tell the other people what to do. Yeah, it's it's a market for violence. It's a, it's a market sponsored by violence. Yes, when the market itself is sponsored by your ability to be helpful to the people around you. And you know, ultimately, U.S. dollars are themselves being fiat currency are a weird hybrid thing, where the ability for U.S. fiat non-counterfeitable government-backed currency to exist, that is also sponsored by violence. It is. But it's done in a way that is abstract and open enough, well, at least was, I don't know about now, but it was, uh, it, it created this, like, like, we successfully created an abstraction layer between violence and markets. That's an accomplishment. That's an amazing thing that has probably prevented millions of deaths. Yeah, well, that's, so, the, that's the positive power of government is yes. to just take care of the violence question mm -hmm. so that everyone else right. can say, that question's yes. been answered. You and I have to figure out right. our issues together without resorting to violence. Yeah, I, I think if people understood that they can't escape from the fact that people are going to be competitively scheming to get the thing that is rare and value, valuable, then at the end of the day, they would be happier that people are scheming to get money rather than scheming to get political influence. Mm -hmm. Because political influence is gotten at, with a knife or a gun, ultimately. It is. When things play out, and you have two people that disagree, and you have two people that believe in these people, and now they're enemies. You're just, you know, you know you're going to spill blood. So, in a capitalistic system, you, companies will fail. People will lose their jobs. There's going to be tremendous inequality. It's not going to be fair. But um, I don't know. I'd rather fight an abstract war than a physical one, personally. Because exactly. if I get stabbed with a knife, I'm dead. If I my business fails or I get evicted, well, I'm you, not dead. Yeah, you can find another I, job. Exactly, because it's we're playing. A, it's a game that we created to substitute for the base level ecological game, which is called the jungle. Yes. And as human beings who are capable of creating abstractions, we are, you know, we're doing ourselves a favor by insulating ourselves and creating abstractions of the underlying ecological involuntary reality that we find ourselves in. So 
we can do better, I think probably what's called for now is some type of actual functional cryptocurrency that isn't just a speculative investment vehicle and actually has transaction fees that make it possible to use it as a currency. That would be the next step. That would, that, 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 you know, cryptocurrency has actually not delivered. It's failed. It's become just a meme game now. It's just to become stocks. So when, if slash when, I'm kind of more on the win camp, when cryptocurrency becomes like um, function, fun, you know, highly liquid and like uh, uncensorable and permissionless and um, all that good stuff, it's a technical problem. When that problem is solved, then it'll probably, um, do a lot to sort of like um, reverse this trend toward retransposing our well, it, politics into the it, realm it, of violence. It, it will free individuals to relate with each other in that yes. fantasy hippie, if we could only go back to trade and barter. Yeah, and everyone could play a bunch of micro scale productive like, games we, with each yes, other. Yes, we'd be free to just yes. play productive games with each other yes. without needing to resort to a violence backed currency yeah. that and by, overlords that, that enforce that all the rules. Bowden and Fauci are yeah. handing down from the clouds. Yeah, and like the king, and we, have to, we don't have to have a bunch of like people's faces on slips of paper to remind everyone how serious and important <laughs> this is that we're in. Although the faces are still fun. Sure, they're fun. Like, I like the fucking yeah. ugly. Benjamin Franklin face. I know. I love the Abraham Lincoln face. They're fun. I love the golden dollar Indian woman. Sacagawea. Sacagawea um, dollars. The um, or it, the Statue of Liberty half dollar one. It's fun. I love that one. It's fun in the same way that the Queen of England is still fun. <laughs> she doesn't really do anything, but she represents a nostalgic cultural heritage. I agree. I think it'd be great. I actually hope that um, that's what happens. Is that we can still play with um, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln memes, but at the end of the day, uh, it's a cryptocurrency based system. Um, it'd be yeah, great. I, yeah, I think that's where, okay. well, it's, it's, show, it's showing the potential obviously to be a better and more objective mm -hmm. currency. So yeah. that means we either die or we get there. So I think we're gonna get there. Dude, did you hear that um, sort of tangential Starting in October, I read this on Hacker News. <laughs> so this headline: Starting in October, um, OnlyFans is going to prohibit uh, sexual content. So isn't that wild? So they are done. They're done. And That's you know, the same thing that happened with Tumblr. Yeah, and you Tumblr got bought out by yes. Yahoo, and then they said we're taking all the porn off. And now, Tumblr's like, done. Yeah, within, no. w within seven days, Tumblr um, just got gutted. The reason why OnlyFans did this is because they're having, they, they're, they're, they were forced to by um, their payment processors. Visa and MasterCard um, told them what they could do. That's wild that you have a, a couple different, you have like a handful of American corporations that have a monopoly on See, money transfer. Isn't that wild? directly, if you want to play the sexist card, the misogyny card, that directly disempowers women. Women have, uh, attractive women, have the unique ability to get startup money yeah. to make their own sovereign life choices. They're just fucking boxing but, those people out of the economy. Yes, Fuck those people. Like, the, yeah. the OnlyFans technology made uh, the same way Uber made people who are able to drive yeah. gave them a way to independently make money. Yeah. OnlyFans was giving uh, attractive young women the ability to not yeah. even get naked if they don't want to. Yeah. Just like uh, bikini photos, if that's all they want to do. It's, <laughs> they don't have to show up to anyone's home and yeah. do blowjobs. Like, they can just take money and now they're more powerful individuals. Dude, and I think that, that that's a good thing. Dude, I feel like this thing has the potential to sort of unite the kind of like pro sex worker people with the libertarian stay the fuck away from my ability to make money people. Because wow, you like are a massive corporation that's like dictating moral values to specifically women and like removing this 
ability, like, like you just removed a lot of opportunity from the world. It doesn't really matter if you think that like porn is good or bad or if it's like a net positive for society or if it's even a net positive for women. It doesn't matter because that's just your opinion. Yeah, you just... You, you don't have the right to tell people to not do it because you think it's bad. Yeah. Like, I'm yeah. sorry, if, so either we have to make a law and amend the Constitution and get rid of the First Amendment and say, sex is bad, you're not allowed to talk about it or anything, or no, you're not, just shut it all down, like, go, like, China-style, just, like, great, um, you know, like, just scrub all potentially offensive content from the Internet, or, um, you know, have to, or we admit that basically we've just, like, given up and outsourced... Um, basic government to like random corporations like which is it you know um, I, I just can't believe that like people don't see that and go okay that's ridiculous immediately we're gonna pass a bill in Congress that says you can't do that um, you know payment, payment processors are not allowed to put pressure on well Congress you know what I'm saying Congress it, can't do it cannot do anything <laughs> and that's the point is that we are completely dead in the water this engine no, broke no, down, no, no, no. and we're just, drifting. Just saying we. <laughs> You're making an error by saying we. Yes, I am. We, I'm making, I'm making we are not Congress. No, that I is, know. That has become a separate fucking parasite that yeah. is completely incapable of doing anything. No. And it completely depends on you and me yeah. identifying with them yeah, and saying we and equating right. our ability to change the world what it comes down with to. their corruption. At some point, you have to just look at that this thing and go, okay, Hey guys, nice. Uh, well, just keep doing nothing, I guess. We're just gonna like big, try to just ignore you and stay out of the way, you know. Try to keep, you know, like we were talking about before, like keep, um, don't, you know, reduce your exposure to this kind of increase your self sufficiency, create relationships biz and business models that do not are not subject to like random destruction at That's the whim right. of some idiot who doesn't know what they're doing. That's right. Yeah, it's like it's a kind of like resilience underground network market community development program that has to occur to create, to rebuild the substrate of society so that we don't well, that's, descend that's into the, violence. That's the only thing society was ever built on in the first place. Was that's right. Human trust that's and right. human relationships yep. and positive sum games yes. to mutual benefit. And that human- That's mm -hmm. what's always created human progress. Yeah. Always. And human trust and all that stuff used to be sponsored by shared culture, shared religion, shared ethnicity, <sighs> shared um, lifestyle, all that stuff, because people were geographically concentrated. But now that everyone's been put in the blender and we've gone <laughs> and pulsed it a couple times, um, we uh, need to consciously recreate the substrate that allows people to trust each other because we can't just rely on um, cultural homogeneity anymore. And it's very telling that the, more, the most stable countries in the world are the ones that through historical happenstance um, are culturally homogenous because they have to do a lot less work to get around. People who live in Iceland, 300,000 people living in Iceland who are by and large all the same culture have a lot less fault lines and fractures and they can solve collective problems easier because they're still leaning on that on that shared cultural trust and i don't think i'm not advocating see if you're if you don't have any ideas about how to solve this problem then you become one of those people who advocates to the return of like homogenous ethno states yeah. and that's what china seems to be doing is they're going like no we're just going to implement the han chinese cultural program to the world because we don't that you know, because this gives us a relative advantage over like cosmopolitan Western democracies that have to deal with the fact that different groups of people get together. But I mean, you know, so if democracy really wants to save itself, we have to like, um, f you know, create new forms of um, social trust building and like um, integrate the disparate elements of society. But it seems like we're doing the opposite right now. We just have like massive propaganda engines that are intent upon creating division and fear. So <laughs> we're in quite the hole. We're gonna have to dig out of that first, I feel like, before stacking any rocks up. I remember when I was living in San Diego on the boat, the first boat version one. It um, was uh, uh, amazing because some some mornings you'd wake up and the outside of all the windows would be just like dripping with condensation cool. and it was like this cool silent like you feel like you're in a cloud and you just hear like this like ding ding kind of like you know ropes stretching but it's like this 
it was like this quiet, like super meditative. Ambient noises ambient. of the dark. Yeah, and just like, but like super suppressed and like, even if you like, if you shouted, you wouldn't have an echo. Because I think like the mist has a way of absorbing sound. So you just feel like everything is, you, you're like in a quiet room or something. Um, yeah, I think about that sometimes when I'm trying to fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> but this is different. This is not fog. No. This is a novel place and time with, with a novel environmental yeah. um, stuff going on. Yeah. And as beings, we have to adapt ourselves to our environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To the extent that we can't change our environment, and I sure as hell can't change the wildfire smoke, so uh, better to put that in the accept it category, <laughs> deal with it category. Try to make it something that I can use to um, cultivate a state of mind that is uh, going somewhere, rather than just like feeling sorry for yourself and hiding indoors. Um, I feel like that's the wrong move because then I'm going to be hiding indoors like three months of every year. <laughs> Don't want to be doing that. That's too much time to give up. I've been too busy and productive yeah. to spend more than a few minutes thinking about it. Yeah. There's way more important shit going on. Yeah, the important shit doesn't stop. It's ever present. Well, it's as present as you are, <laughs> I guess. Mm -hmm. That's a way of saying it. <laughs> um, it's like whether or not you think you are independent from your environment is a mental device. It's a perspective. You can be, or you can, you know, you can what you can hide from the environment, uh, or you can integrate yourself with the environment, and whichever one of those works best for you. I've always found that like trying to uh, like romanticize whatever situation I'm in <laughs> is a good strategy because um, from a certain perspective, there's something cool about being in like a apocalyptic smoke world. Um, there's sun being red, the moon being like a blood red thing hanging in the sky. There's, yeah. some, there's something spooky in about it or something, you know? It's, it's novel. Yeah. It's new. Yeah. There's, there's a pressure on you. Yeah. I notice sometimes a kind of insideness it creates subjectively. I'm inside this experience. Yeah. We're outside, you're driving somewhere, um, but you're in, like you're inside a situation of smoke. Yeah. And you're inside a place of time. You're, you're being held uh, by unique uh, historical circumstances. Yeah, that's an amazing perspective. I love thinking of myself as being f floating in a raft on the the river of history. It's amazing uh, because it's like really profound to be in history, to be in the world, to be in 2021. We're in 2021 and so we're like, ah, 2021, this is, you know. but like looking back on it, <clears throat> um, we're gonna see things from a larger perspective as you always do in hindsight, or you often do in hindsight, I should say. And uh, yeah, it would be a shame to squander the moment because you couldn't get with it. Because, you know, if you wait until you have the perspective of hindsight to do anything, well, then you're not going to do anything. Because <laughs> you can't. Because <clears throat> you're in a new, you're in a new situation by the time you have the perspective to objectively see, easily objectively see where you were. I have this pet thought about China. Mm-hmm last few months where I think we have exported the slavery economy to the countries that are still willing to enslave their populace. Oh shit. And wow. We 
fancy ourselves a nation based on the market and based on property rights, yeah, based on free speech, but we still have an ongoing addiction to oppression. Because that's what, that kind of oppression is what creates the shitty working conditions that produce mountains of cheap shit that we still buy. And we're still mm. dependent on it. We're part of the karmic um, process that, that is creating that. And where that's a point most effectively aimed is at um, people like me and more rabid like conservatives as such who think they're free and think that they would have nothing to do with communism ever. Hmm. It's like, well, you're actually being supported and sponsored by communism still. You're still benefiting from it because there's a communist nation over there that because they're authoritarian and oppressive, they're able to keep individuals from becoming empowered yeah. and, and uh, make wages be fair. As a, as a side tangential note, I love how conservative means what liberal did like six years ago. <laughs> That's kind of funny. In what sense? <laughs> well, just like, you know, free speech, um, individual rights, stuff like that. It's funny how like you people nowadays who think those things are like, well, I guess I'm conservative. Yeah. It's, just, it's just like a funny little thing. But um, mm. yeah, I, I'm less will I think I'm less willing to embrace the conservative label than you are because I, um, I don't know. <laughs> it just gives me flashbacks <laughs> to, uh, I don't know. I don't, uh, I don't trust the Republicans either, but uh, I just think they're not in power right now. So I find myself, I guess, aligned with the underdog, maybe. But uh, well, okay. when when I use the words in relation to myself, I don't refer to any politician. Yeah. If you're a politician, you're not. You're not. Con you're not conservative. <laughs> you're not really. In, you're you're like a, I guess, a, a leech of some kind, a non an unthinking um, prop in the theater. It's on the on the stage. Yeah. Yeah. St still thinking the economy of pull is the the sustainable way to move forward. Yeah, but I didn't want to derail what you were saying um, about China. That's it's a very insightful point. Um, well, I think, I think mm -hmm. the it's an existential issue: communism, collectivism in general, versus uh, individualism, and. Uh, set of principles that um, focuses on the individual and upholds the rights of the individual, not of any group. Um, yeah. That's an existential issue. And I think collectivism is a virus, a stagnant cancer on the human mind that allows you to project your own problems outside of the realm of your actual agency. And that allows bad actors to take all that agency that yeah. people aren't uh, taking for themselves right. and so that they can, those bad actors can have power over you. And um, that's an existential issue and putting it all over on China and saying you have nothing to do with that in your own life, even in political economic terms, isn't true. It's, it's a much more present issue that has to be dealt with um, to the level of the individual. Yeah. And then the level of the individual where that happens, it's not economic, it's not political, it's whether you're living second-handed or not, whether you're living f as a first cause, as the as an end unto yourself, or if you're living second-handed and living through the eyes of other people. Are you living re reactively as opposed to proactively? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, what a shame to squander your life reacting to the phantasms of the collective mind. Well, I've been doing that myself in lots of ways that I, it's an ongoing process yeah. 
to unpack that and become more and more individuated yeah and more and more sovereign and not need uh results that are ultimately in the hands of other people yeah to decide whether i get my job done or not like when you wake up in the morning if you have a psychological dependence upon looking at the news and going oh fuck what kind of dystopian shit is happening that demotivates me if you, or conversely, like, I'm happy now because what I think is good is happening based on what other people are doing, that is a disempowered state of mind, you're, if I'm understanding you correctly. You're blowing in the wind. Yeah. Because you're taking your, your experience secondhand yeah. from, out, from the outside. Yeah, you have to be like an animal, like a little mammal that scurries around under its own power, regardless of whether it's cold outside or not. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the lizard that is relying, relying upon, like, craw crawling up on the rock, going like, yeah, before it can move. No, ev yeah. every human is a potential free energy machine. Yeah. Yes. And you have to develop a personal um, understanding of how you yourself are a sovereign free energy machine, self-propelled. Yeah. yeah and then the relationships you make with the world around you and with the people around you are the relationships of a voluntary mutual benefit, not of need and desperation and yeah. codependence. Yeah, we're not, we're not like ants, we're not bees, we're mammals, you know? <laughs> mammals are self-contained engines of opportunity. We're scurrying around, we're finding things, we're, it's like our deep psychological heritage is aligned with the idea that we can um, uh, change the world, get something from the world, and do something with ourselves. Um, yeah, it, that's a very empowering perspective, I think, even to relate that to the idea of um, whether or not you consider yourself part of the world China system. Um, I, I, you know, from the defeatist, nihilistic, pessimistic point of view, um, you might think like, okay, well, China sucks. Um, so, you know, if from a nihilistic point of view, you're like, that's that's you're taking on negative energy um, by including yourself uh, as part of the problem of China. But I don't really see it that way. I think that um, the only reason, the only way that's negative is if you feel like you have no power to change things. Um, it's definitely more empowering to recognize your interdependence with things whilst also not giving up your ability to um, participate in it. Because, you know, that's, I think, that can be a crutch for a lot of people. Admitting that you're part of a large, massive system is a way of saying, I can't do anything about it. It's not my choice, it's, it's outside of me. But, um, the, you know, the, the truth is, is it, it's, it's weirdly outside of you and inside you at the same time, just like the wildfire smoke. The, the red moon hanging in the sky is in your mind. You are creating the emotional associations with that mm -hmm. image that you are experiencing. You're experiencing objective reality, but you're, you're allowing objective reality to turn itself into a subjective felt experience of your life. Um, just like looking at China and looking at the factories of wage slaves that is sponsoring you know, the Walmart aisle at your local Walmart, <laughs> um, that uh, it contains a kind of injunction, in, in a sense, of like, what's your, are, are, you, are you going to, are you willing to um, make a choice and formulate your relationship to this system? Like, what are you gonna do about it? Well, you could try buying secondhand shit, for one. You could, you could not buy cheaply manufactured junk that's one small thing you could do. Mm -hmm. I don't really think you're, anyone's gonna solve the problem of the world by just doing that. It's kind of like little lifestyle signal things. I really don't. I don't think that like turning off your faucet's gonna solve the problem of like water. I think there has to be like large scale coherent, coherent strategies, but ultimately those large scale coherent strategies require um, those an are, attitude of individuals willing to participate in them. Yeah, those yeah. are downstream of yes. the individual Absolutely. lifestyle choices. Yes, collectivism, uh, that's what I think is it's a little more complex maybe than the this dichotomy between individualism and collectivism because there seems to be a kind of um, ordering where, you know, putting collectivism, uh, you know, positing the existence of some kind of healthy collective that is going to create healthy, free individuals 
is, you know, it's the proverbial cart before the horse. If you imagine a kind of Star Trek world, or well, that's a bad example, not Star Trek. If you imagine a world that we haven't seen yet, I don't think there's even any good examples of this in fiction that I can think of, but if you imagine a future where people become, like if, where the human race on average truly becomes more enlightened and like freedom loving and tolerant and internally integrated and closer to equilibrium of what it means to be a human and higher equality of opportunity exactly and more just more um meaning in life kind of meaning coupled with like liberty like when you have maximum ability to affect your life in this universe that we find ourselves in and like you can do that without participating in regressive systems that depend on stepping on certain people whether or not you want to like when you know if we integrate this system that we're a part of i think that um a bunch of free individuals working together could really voluntarily end up in some kind of like you know what the dream of collectivism is supposed to be the most idealistic visions of like collective people if you if people were like happy and free um and not like burdened by a bunch of like mental viral parasites, you know, um, then I, I think like you could totally have like amazing cities that didn't really need a lot of enforcement because, you know, like look at like a really nice community. There's not a lot of like, the best way to solve a problem is to not create one. If, if, if you have high social trust and not a lot of suffering, that gives you the, that gives free individuals more ability to act in ways that look like we're caring for each other because our incentives are aligned because my life doing good for me doesn't involve doing bad to you like having a set of games a set of social technology at the ready and having people buy into that thing from a high level understanding that this is what's good for us um i think yeah you, you could probably achieve a kind of utopian hippie community shit <laughs> um, if everyone was fed and emotionally satisfied. I think most of the wars and stuff, like the stuff that's on the news right now of like Afghanis like packing on to cargo planes and like clinging to them and falling off literally as the plane is taking off from an airfield. I don't know if you saw that. Uh -huh. Happened like three days ago. That was fucking tragic that there is a world out there where people because of some large scale abstract reason are so terrified of being like murdered by other people that they think it's a good idea to cling to the landing gear of a departing aircraft. They have to know they're gonna die, you know? Well, they're panicked. That's what I'm saying, it, like th that kind of thing is so, it's so tragic to see that massive dysfunction in human society that is, you know, it's the karma of 20 years of military Occupation, well, more than 20. Before America, it was the Russians. Before the Russians, it was the, what was it like? I don't want to speak out of bullshit, but I feel like there was another empire that occupied Afghanistan. I don't really know what it was. But um, yeah, it's just you see like the debt that's built up from the kind of like fear and dysfunction in those type of societies and the, the world America, China, Afghanistan system <laughs> is fucked. And so it, it, and it boils down and it filters down to the base level reality of people clinging onto the landing gear of planes. Um, uh, yeah, it just shows you how basically war, war as the most, is the, as the worst possible consensus mechanism. War is the default violence. We're going to force reality into one frame because we have given up and squandered all the other tools that we have to do so. So we're gonna just kill people now to make reality coherent. That's, um, that's the problem that has to be addressed. Mm. China or Afghanistan or America, it's all part of the same interrelated like matrix that we're getting a mirror on now. We're getting a mirror that shows in very plain sight what's happening, but there's still a large class of people that are playing the ideological blame game. And uh, I hope those people wake up soon because yeah, I was pretty fucking disturbed watching that video of those people. I can't, I couldn't believe that. It was a weird, trippy, darkly psychedelic vision of like U.S. Air Force, you know, 
taxiing down the runway and then like human clinging, like what, how is that possible that that exists in the world where you have this super powerful, this symbol of like superpower might and then totally unable to solve an airport. Like, I don't know, weird, super weird. I, I didn't find it disturbing at all. I found it completely expected. That's the only possible result of interventionist warfare and trying to install states of order yeah. where we don't <clears throat> belong. Yeah. Um, it's happened successfully once in Japan. And that was a circumstance unique to Japanese culture yeah. and to their ability to be Japanese and adapt and have an incredibly strong national identity yeah. that could decide as a nation to learn from their uh, the people who defeated them yeah. and become better as a result. Yeah. I think it also helps that... Um, America after uh, after 1945 in Japan it didn't uh, totally dismantle the existing um, government structure right and, but rather like um, integrated it I, I think that was also a huge de part decision that was very good um, you know we didn't go through and you know take everyone out of power and be like, we're going to install a puppet government. It's like, yeah, well, we, like, people, yeah, people who are running. Symbolically, we yes. did not decapitate the emperor. No. That was a really <laughs> good decision. Yeah. Yeah, but there's, a, there's definitely something about this. Um, Japan is a highly ordered, highly um, conscious, self-conscious society. It's not yeah. a tribal medieval mm -hmm. place. No, Like, it they'd already solved the tribal medieval part of their history. Yeah, they did, because they, there was a point where it was like warlords and shit. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, and yes. uh, it was like Dutch ships showing up that gave those tribes a national identity for the first time. Huh. Uh, it was the white man showing up and making it clear to everyone on the islands, like, oh, there's an outside world and we are one people. Yeah. Because these people are white and <laughs> coming from the ocean. Oh, dude, this is like Independence Day, Will Smith. <laughs> Basically what it is. It's like, oh, great. Now we have these fucking aliens that show up. That's right. um, suddenly we find a lot of unity. Yeah, maybe that's, that's right. maybe that's what it would take for humans. It's like some kind of a... Uh, that, uh, that myth of Independence Day is really compelling, I think, for that reason. It's like um, the, com um, the common enemy thing, the common... after. You know, Footnote this common external enemy because I think what you when you have an internal enemy like COVID, a hidden enemy, it seems like it just creates more division because it's easy to blame people. Well, that that enemy is just the abyss itself. Yeah. Uncertainty itself. Fear. The fact of being yeah. physical in an unknown universe. Yeah. Um, Bodily threats. Yeah. N n lack of confidence in your own health. Physically yes. and emotionally and community-wise, yeah. Yeah. We, we set ourselves up facing, for this. Facing the karma of your own ill health. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, living second-handed or not. So the people who have, are the least healthy and uh, the most codependent are the most heavily hit by COVID yeah. and by any unforeseen circumstance. Yeah, I read, a, I read some, I had an interesting take on this. Oh, it was that Zuby guy. He says something really intelligent about how it's, uh, you know, if the government actually cared about public health, they would recognize that um, there is an extremely strong correlation between uh, being unhealthy, poorly nourished, unrested, psychologically disturbed, and obese, um, and dying from COVID. So you have, like... The average person being unhealthy, and then you have a novel pathogen that predictably, uh, you know, strongly impacts the people who are already in a state of compromised health. So, if you really cared about public health, you would address the root cause of why the population is vulnerable to something like COVID. Yeah. Obviously, there's going to be people who are like 80 years old, who like, people, everyone dies. There's no solution to this, but you could save like orders of magnitude more lives if you put the same amount of resources as you're doing into like suppressing a virus 
suppressing a respiratory virus by locking everyone in different, like, like that kind of, that, you know, toddler level reaction to a crisis. Yeah. If you, if you put the same amount of energy, money and urgency on like, um, you know, dealing with the fact that like our food system is like, like most of the food at the grocery store is poison. Yeah. If, if that was addressed, you know, well, what about the next pandemic? Yeah. So are you just going to like wait till it happens and then create a vaccine or like maybe, you know, we could start like uh, solving like food crisis. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. Or maybe like the fact that like everyone is we have like sh- cities that aren't walkable where everyone's like locked in a little thing and no one gets, gets any exercise. Everyone's dependent on a car. Okay. If you dealt with that problem, that would be a point of orders of magnitude more leverage to deal with public health than this extremely reactive <clears throat> and ineffectual um, theater type reaction to a problem. Well, I, so, that's a good point, I thought. I'm flashing back to the first weeks of COVID um, and the first month of COVID where I took, I guess this is sort of in response to people who are hyper democrat and hyper like uh, focused on following the news and taking the vaccine and yeah. masking up and right. telling me I need to do all that too and yeah. family members who are really upset when I don't do one uh, biblical pronouncement from Fauci or another. Mask be upon him. <laughs> May he be forever <laughs> triple masked. <laughs> Our Lord Fauci. <laughs> um, in response to that, I like in response to the underlying accusation that I'm one of those people not taking this seriously. I took it completely seriously from day one, um, albeit in my own way. Yeah. When as soon as this started, I upgraded how much I account for my own health. And I, so did I. I aggressively thought about how I can become healthier and what is most stable and uh, most uh, well-grown and has the deepest roots in my experience. Look, same here, man. If I, if like I'm not, I, I immediately yeah. thought of like, who are my most trusted people? Who is my community? And how can I deepen those relationships immediately? And where are my weakest points psychologically? Where are my weakest points physically? And how can I immediately begin addressing those weaknesses? How am I gonna be able to maintain the ability to smoke a cigarette if I want to, if I don't focus on my health? Think about that. Um, yeah, it's very practical. Um, whether it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it's like, but there, that, or, there's a lot of things that depend upon being in good health. But yeah. that requires <clears throat> thinking for yourself. Yes, it you does. cannot wait for the CDC to tell you what the fuck to do about your own health. I heard they said you were supposed to do this. <laughs> They've changed. The guidance has changed. Like what I've done at most steps has been counterintuitive to the narrative, but completely rational to like normal grandmother's wisdom. Like I went outside the first day or the first few days. I took some a little bit of dirt from the garden, put it under my tongue. Mm-hmm. Like voluntarily ex- like expose yourself to things that are gonna get your immune system going. Like you need a robust <clears throat> immune system. You don't run away from bad actors, uh, bacteriologically speaking. You walk up to a manageable amount of bacteria so that your immune system is constantly learning constantly active I can see the headline right now weirdo hippie dude advocates eating dirt to cure COVID <laughs> no but dude oh, that's... prophylactically to prevent COVID. oh I don't think yeah I think that the um, idea that being uh, like adopting like a bubble boy type reality that is going to somehow improve collective health is a wildly naive bordering on well, it intentionally depends, it malicious. It depends on not thinking for yeah. yourself. It depends on waiting, needing other people's permission to make your yeah. own decisions about your own health. And to, I didn't do that. To me, yeah, it's just like the, the whiplash of seeing a large group of people who have formerly been advocating 
for all this like natural holistic um you know uh notion of health like now the, advocating for uh complete dependence on the masks from china and like and all, <laughs> yeah and like Total complete dependence on the hand sanitizer made yeah. from China. <laughs> Rub it in. Yeah. Oh, and uh, you know, careful. Don't don't breathe. Don't don't associate. Don't stop talking to people. Stop. Uh, like I'm sorry. You know, th that's why it's so weird when people say like, you know, we should um, normalize masks and like make it uh, community health and like this fuzzy kind of like safety thing. It's like, don't you see how sterile and like, just. Well, kind of gross that is. There's like, natural immune systems happening yeah, already it, of connection yeah. and being with people you love yes. and seeing their fucking face. And literally exchanging and information between your immune system. Yes. You, think, you don't think that there's yes. communication? Like, okay, why do people kiss each other? Uh-huh, Think yeah. about that. Isn't that weird? Why do mammals do this thing where we're going up to each other, we go, <laughs> what the fuck? If you think about that, that's so strange. Do you think that, don't you think that there's something related to exchanging bodily fluids that's kind of important and probably beneficial for health? Exactly. When you do it in a measured way? Like, like okay, you know, obviously you're not gonna like, you know, like, there's, okay, if you take a dump and you, and you see a pile of shit on the ground, uh, it smells bad, it looks bad, it's disgusting. That, Stay away that, from it. Yeah, that is an evolutionary adaptation telling you don't, don't, don't fuck with, don't, it, that's shit, it's, it contains like bacteria, don't, don't, don't eat that. Okay, great. So, I don't know, dogs, I don't know what dogs are doing, but humans <laughs> are generally disgusted by like piles of shit, right? So, why is it that humans, but dogs do a bunch of other stuff, dogs also like lick each other, dogs like, you know, like, lick each other's assholes for some disgusting reason. You know what? Uh, clearly that's good for dogs, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't be part of their evolutionary psychology. You know, for humans, to, for a slightly less extreme example, uh, kissing each other, hugging each other, um, doing all sort of like disgusting mammalian behaviors with each other. In general, being close yes. with people. Skin to skin contact. Like, I mean, it's been proven that like babies that are not like held and like nursed and like, you know, breathed on are like, shriveled, unhealthy babies. Yeah. They, they die soon. They die a lot faster than if like you take a baby and you like cradle it and like hold it really close so it can integrate its newly uncalibrated immune system with the rest of, you know, humanity with its mother and its like close kin and stuff like that. So that is like such a hippie idea. And why was that thrown out immediately as soon as like, um, that, you know, that aesthetic, that sensibility about natural health, why was that tossed out immediately as soon as, like, pharmaceutical government media conglomerate decided that we're going to force a new narrative on the population that everyone's dangerous and that, like, you have to resort to this kind of, like, sterile medical technology as a substitute for your own human health. Like, it's really weird to see how little conviction lots of people had when faced with this new thing that they didn't actually it makes me think like you didn't actually believe all that stuff you wanted to pretend to be a natural health person because it was fashionable but when the rubber meets the road you don't actually believe that what you mm -hmm. want is to to believe an authority figure who's going to tell you to you know um wrap yourself in saran wrap mm -hmm. metaphorically and otherwise yeah. i don't know it's it's very enlightening and i'm sure people um i'm sure people see that but it's not, it's hard to, to articulate that in an environment where, you know, you're gonna be cast in like as like some kind of murderer or something for not, for not doing those things, but I'm willing to take that risk myself. Well, that's only in specific places in the country. Yeah, that's true. Um, in this country, I mean. Other parts of the other, world too. Other parts of the world have different situations, but it's, here like. Other parts of the world are even crazier. I know, but, but yeah. here like, it's only local, like yeah. California, yeah. New York. Yeah. Uh, a couple other liberal centers where right. it's so rabidly irrational. They're not liberal. They don't deserve to be called liberal. They're very. They do not. They're highly illiberal. Highly hyper reactionary. In fact, they're not. There's nothing liberal about this. This at all. No. Liberal. Liberal carries in the actual definition. Um, confronting risk yes. voluntarily yes. because you know that's the only way to adapt and grow openness and to meet the world yes and this is risk aversion taken to the point of the destruction of the civilized world yeah. potentially yeah 
uh, when risk is inseparable from health. Destruction of community, of relationships, of emotional health. Of our immune yes. system as a, as a civilization. Yeah. Co human connection is the immune system. It is the basis for health. Yeah. Yes. Um, you you got to have risk to grow. You got to take on risk in a measured way to keep growing and be ready for whatever the world hands you next. Can you believe how would we be classified politically if someone in 2005 had a time machine and could listen to could see this podcast? Isn't that wild? Like it just blows my mind how upside down clown world reality we've gotten into where like um, we're sitting here <laughs> talking, advocating for this and yet like, I don't know, it's so strange. I feel like we're in an extremely unstable, far from equilibrium condition and that in the near future we're going to see another whiplash effect as this kind of thing corrects itself. Yeah. It has to. I, the spring uh, is stretched pretty tightly right now. Like I've just carried forward the strongest principles that yeah. I've had from the beginning. Yeah. That's all I've been doing. And the Overton window yeah. has uh, painted me as one thing or painted me as another thing. Yeah. But it's always been about the individual for me. Yeah. And it's always been about sovereignty and being of maximal personal power uh, First, so that I can be a happy person, yeah. and taking for granted that that's important that I be happy, but understanding that that's the only way I can help my community is if I'm a healthy node yeah. of fulfillment. Uh, and you can't be a healthy node of fulfillment if you depend on other people's participation in right. your game for you to be healthy. You're like, willing to like force them into it. You you yeah. have to be healthy and fulfilled whether or not there's anyone around you or not. And yeah. COVID acted as a lockdown, acted as a terrific acid test for showing you your own sovereignty. Yeah. Uh, are you healthy unto yourself or not? Because you're not going to have recourse to your community anymore. You're just gonna be directly confronted with how you feel about yourself. Yeah. But um, in terms of being more left before and more right now, it's the same principles I've just been developing this entire time um, and principles that I think maximize equality of opportunity and uh, maximize empowerment to everyone. The, 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 the ultimate minority is the individual and the ultimate collective term that everyone that is actually inclusive of everyone is the individual. Well, when you see how that idea is under attack, yes. the idea that um, th there's a lot of people who want to say, this is like that, um, the new, the new fangled racial, racial essentialism that you see is it's like actually saying that, um, no, the the, the ultimate minority is is this category and that category, and you know, if you don't um, subscribe, if you don't like and subscribe to <laughs> one of these political identities, then you're part of the problem. It's like get the fuck out of here with that. That's never been true. Um, it's not true now. It, you know, yeah, that Overton window thing is huge. Is a weird thing, and there's a lot of people who think like it's strange because there's you know I. I Sometimes on like Reddit or whatever, you see people who say something like, the Overton window has shifted so far to the right that I can't believe this is normal now. And then like some of the people are like, wait, what are you talking about? Yeah, the Overton shifted, has yeah. shifted so much <clears throat> to the left that yeah, I can't do, even believe it. How do you, wow, wait, what? Like it's so, it's really indicative of like an incredibly um, sort of uh, uh, inconsistent reality that we're living in. I, and I, that, that, when you see that kind of inconsistency, play out, it makes you, it's like a little signal that, that we are, there's some extreme tension in the system. And tension is energy. Um, it's potential energy, you know, metaphorically, like in psychic energy or whatever. And uh, yeah, I think in the next, I think the next three years is gonna be even crazier than the last five years, personally. And the reason I'm choosing three and five is because they add up to eight and because it starts at 2016. Like we talked about before, how 20, right. 2016 was this 
like boundary shearing effect of reality that we're like on this new little like bubble universe that has that has yet right. that has yet to close the circle. But um, a new yeah. a new anime arc has yeah. begun in twenty sixteen. Yeah. yeah, totally. Um, take your word for the anime part. Like <laughs> I said, but that uh, it's crazy. So yeah, I don't know. Definitely, definitely time to get with it. It's time to get with it and um, try to align yourself with the current and swim in the direction that you want to and use the, p the force of the current to get where you're going rather than just like treading water. Um, Cause treading water is exhausting. Weirdly swimming in a, in a certain direction is a lot less exhausting than going nowhere. Um, and that's why I feel like everyone's kind of fenced in, exhausting themselves, feeling like they're about to slip underneath the surface and drown. Um, you have to move, like you have to change. It's not voluntary at this point. It makes me think of like that, there's like that song by like, was it like the birds or something? It's like, um, the waters are rising around you. Um, what is it like? I can't remember this song. Maybe I could find the reference later. You can put it in the pod, but it yeah. speaks to this. It speaks to this, but in terms of this, it was in the context of like the 60s revolution. But I feel like we're at that moment again where you have to uh, sink or swim. And um, definitely don't cling to the... Uh, The, uh, the concrete block that's being handed to you. <laughs> You're gonna go straight to the bottom. Culturally, we have the tension of confronting the other. Yeah. And the other is now in our own borders. Um, it's not in this... It's in our own pocket. It's not in this enemy nation anymore. No. It's in your neighbors now. Yeah. But it's still the same principle of how do you interact with the alien? And I think when you find yourself in front of the other, this is taking off from your uh, note of how we're confronting the reality of completely different experiences people yeah. are having yeah. right in front of you. We're talking the same language, but we're having a completely different worldview and there's uh, a crazy tension that that creates, but uh, archetypally, that's confronting the alien, confronting the other. Um, when, you, when you find yourself in that situation, you can take that as an indicator that you're in the underworld, archetypally. What you say does not come across to the person in front of you. This is, a, this is now an Alice in Wonderland situation. Huh. where what you do does not produce the results you expect. What you say does not create the meaning in the listener that you're trying to convey. And uh, Jordan Peterson's first like advice about being in the underworld is to tell the truth first and foremost. Only tell the truth um, because there's already so much fog of war um, in the environment that to obscure the truth of your experience in any way is just going to make a confusing situation even worse. Yeah, the truth is an objective fixed point. That's right. Or you can connect to other people. That's right. And yeah. connect to your own yeah. reality and understand mm -hmm. what ground you're yeah. standing on yeah. for bad or good. Right. It's, it's, at least it's objective. And yeah. The objective presupposes a next step from there. Yeah, that's a good point. That the, the truth doesn't necessarily mean good; it means objective, yes. which is which, which is what good is premised on is objectivity. Um, yeah, it's an important point. And I refer again to well, I don't know how much I referred to it in the other podcast, but I was talking about uh, AI and AI gaining artificial generalized intelligence. Yeah. And at what point do we have to start recognizing that AI has human rights? And if uh, gorillas started uh, gaining conscious reasoning, at what point in that evolution would we have to start granting yeah. uh, the rights of the individual to the gorilla? Yeah. And in history, we've confronted this problem a billion times yeah, already. Yeah, over and over again. Like yep. when women 
when just a handful of women started not believing in the cultural narrative and being individuals instead of the cultural view of what a woman was supposed to be. Instead of being a political proxy for their husband or whatever it is. The entire yeah. nation then had to deal with what if we were wrong about women? What if they are actually people? This whole time. <laughs> yeah, right. And that was a huge existential issue where yeah. you were confronting the other. Uh, if you were a typical patriarchal man of that time, maybe you've never even had the experience before that a woman could be on an equal rational plane uh, with you and that's gonna create this crazy cognitive dissonance. That's why it's so regressive to try to drag politics back to the realm of racial and sexual identity. That is why it's, it's like a step backward. It's a, I don't know where, I, that seems like to me it's very destructive because it's, it's like it's almost like tacitly admitting that no, we can't really have egalitarianism, we're gonna go back to the way it was, which is like feudal identity politics. Um, I don't know, I'm, that 20th century was really, <laughs> saw a lot of dark things come from that type of politics. And uh, well, it's really like, dangerous to think that it can be done now and that, for a positive, that for a positive that, result. That progress we've made from those things uh, through the civil rights movements mm -hmm. into greater individual rights for more individuals, that wasn't, predicated on cultural understandings uh, at any point that was created by powerful singular individuals who yeah. decided to make a change in the midst of a relative vacuum and the rest of the populace was kind of dragged along yeah still you trying to use their uh, living second-handed not really fully thinking about things for themselves and so that's still the situation we're in now where most people don't do the hard work of creating their own thoughts, of creating their own view of the world based on their own experience and their own sense of truth. Yeah. Uh, most people are still doing what they've always done, which is accept truth secondhand from an authority figure, whether that's their parents or their church or the government, or their job. Or Pfizer. Yeah, <laughs> and it's still the same situation where it's up, yeah. to, it's up to you as an individual to act on your own truth uh, and not refer to other people's truth for what to do next. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's very well put. And it, it to to move so I so that's my response to saying we've taken a step backward. Yeah, I, I think it's still the same accurate picture of how the population actually thinks, and it's still the same solution of it, it's gonna be just a few isolated individuals who push things forward. It's not some radical shift of a worldview that pushes things forward. Yeah. It's people who just independently, independently decide that they're going to create the world they wish to see. Yeah, um, visions come from individuals and if the vision is powerful enough, um, it will, other people will get on board with it. Because um, other people have to get on board for there to be social change, but the people, the crowds, the <clears throat> mobs do not create new ideas. They go along with new ideas for better or worse. Um, yeah, it's up to, it's kind of like makes me think of that whole thing of like the market being sort of an involuntary thing. You have a market of ideas. That's an also involuntary thing that we're living in. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems like right now we have a lot of like infective, ill-conceived viral particles of, um, you know, mimetic content, mimetic structures that are just like sweeping through and uh, compromising people's ability to function as healthy organisms. And uh, they're, you know, we're just like, they're hijacking their conscious machinery to make them well, it's, repeat those ideas. It's the same atmospheric conditions you encounter as a monkey in the jungle. Yeah. Like the jungle does not care about you. There's, play, there's aspects of the jungle that can play positive some games with you 
that you have to seek out and grow relationships with. Yes. But you have to constantly contend with uh, ill, uh, with uh, uh, malevolent influences that are sweeping through. And that's my response to us as a nation, as a world, freaking out about this new germ. Oh my God, it's a novel COVID-19 virus. We've never encountered anything like this before. Yeah. No, that's not true. You live in a physical universe. There are bad things out there. And yeah. so you have to take measured risk on your own uh, power in regular doses so that when something bad happens, you are able to step up to it and leverage it for your own benefit. Yeah, absolutely. And everyone, and oh my gosh, it's killing so many people, that's bad. Well, you can't do anything about that. Like, those people are reaping the benefits of not aggressively expanding their own health. Like, there's nothing you can do for someone who doesn't want to be healthy. They're gonna become unhealthy and it can be COVID-19 or it can be a flu or it can be just like not being uh, awake and aware enough while they're driving and they get into a car accident that needn't have happened if they had gotten more sleep that night. Or it could be like getting hooked on Oxycontin because yeah. you are fucking depressed and you just have to escape, yeah. So, it's, so that's how right. I think about these yeah. loose mental viruses loose in the world. Yeah. Like that's nature taking care of itself. Yeah. And that's nature sending out germs to force the evolution of the human. There's physical germs that force you to grow more healthy if you wanna keep adapting. And there's mental germs that force you to be more intellectually rigorous. It's making me imagine, I'm thinking of this a concept of punctuated equilibrium. Um, which is part of the evolutionary history of Earth in a biological sense that, you know, uh, immediately following all of the mass cataclysms that have occurred in Earth's history, like asteroids hitting or mass volcanic eruptions. Uh, punctuated what a what? Punctuated equilibrium. Okay. Where you have a ecosystem that evolves to reach a state of optimum um, maximal or approaching maximal adaptation to a given set of environmental conditions and you have a lot of uh, you know genetic technology that um, creates uh, organisms that efficiently exploit every niche in the ecosystem yes. um, after a while there becomes fewer and fewer niches because those niches have been um, uh, you know have spawned organisms to take advantage of them and you know that speaks to the fact that it, ecological niches comes before the organism that filled it. Um, the, or, the ecological niche is like the class that instantiates an organism to, to use that niche given enough time. And there's a direct analogy to the cultural landscape that we have a, we are asymptotically, appro we were, I should say, up until about 2016, asymptotically approaching a point of uh, ecological stagnation. And so an asteroid hit the earth. That asteroid was called, was the social media, internet, Trump system. Yeah. And it devastated the existing ecology. And now... And, and it set us up for a yes. maximum vulnerability yes. to get hit by a more objective yep. meteor all the of COVID. Yep, and all the dinosaurs died. And now we're a bunch of little rats, mammals, scrambling around in the rubble, evolving rapidly. Yeah, and finding yeah. new niches yes. that have been so created. So in some sense, the world is in a state of incredible maximal opportunity right now for people who don't give up. That's right. So that's the silver lining, I think. Yeah, silver lining, like, the power of the human is such that you don't need there to be a silver lining to a disaster. If you're a human being, you're your you own silver lining. You have the ability <laughs> yeah. to create because your mind silver is, lining. Because your mind is an ecology. It's a self-contained ec ecology, ecological system that's capable of generating novelty, just like planetary scale biological ecosystems can come up with new ideas for how to exploit energy mm -hmm. in the form of organisms. So thoughts are very 
organismic in that sense that they're like, wow, this is an opportunity to have a new structure to process the incoming psychic energy and like turn it into something that's capable of reproducing on its own without needing recourse to these viral things, you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. in that state of maximal evolutionary pressure, there's an incredible opportunity for uh, infectious agents as well. That's right. So you can't get one without the other. That's right. If you had a totally equilibrated, stagnant culture, pretty hard, probably pretty hard to get um, famous in that culture because you don't, um, you know, there's, everyone's already figured out the best ways to do everything. There's, it's harder to offer, offer novelty when you've had a, something iterating on itself with little change for a long period of time. And uh, it's weird. There's a funny trade-off there. But like the wildfire smoke, that's the world we live in. It's not voluntary. <laughs> so we're living in 2021. This is, our, this is the kind of podcast we're making. This is the life that we could be living. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it just seems dumb to like pretend it's not.